as I've been always saying, uh, I don't. My my issue is not that there is that whether or not there is peace for the Christian or getting peace. The issue more than getting peace is holding peace, right? So we talked about provocations, a provocative generation, a lots of things that will provoke and stir you. And the, there remains a rest of the people of God. We have a resting place, right? And that's where we want to stay. And stay in our resting place. And uh, fundamentally that means you're at rest, you're at peace, you have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ to walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. You have obtained witness, you know, the Spirit, His Spirit bears witness that we are the Son of God. Have root in yourself. These which have no root in themselves fall away. They lose their peace. They leave off their resting place. They get provoked. They enter into their own works because they have no root in themselves. So when tribulation and persecution ariseth because of the Word, as we said before, you can be in trouble because of your sin and your iniquity. There's no thankfulness in that. Now we are all going to go through that. We're all going to be chastised for our sin and our iniquity, and it's inevitable and necessary. But what thanks do you have for that? All you can do is endure through your cleansing and your purging. What we're really after for is suffering for righteousness' sake. Well, this is an attainment, isn't it? That's the fullness of the stature. That's sonship when you suffer for righteousness' sake. Yeah. You know, we talked about the crosses, right? We're all first the bitter man. Ah, if you're Christ, save yourself and us. Ah, ah. And then, then, then we, it, it's like the progression of the crosses. Then we flip over to the other cross and we think or I think, rethink ourselves and says, wait a second now, um, we're on this cross because... We are worthy of this. We're sinful. We're iniquitous. We deserve this and more. But that man, Jesus, you, he's done nothing. Don't you fear God? Or you, know, you might even say it to yourself. Wow, what am I thinking? Don't I fear God? <laughs> I deserve all this and more. But Jesus, he didn't... This man, he did nothing amiss. Lord, remember me. You know, that's, that's the co- broken, <laughs> contrite, repentant heart. Uh, the man coming to himself recognizes his own depravity and the innocency and righteousness and purity and power of Jesus Christ, which causes him to call upon Jesus. Amen. And then, uh, then, Amen. like we are saying last week, first Christ is formed in you. That's a whole uh, a process. Then, then he comes to the birth. He comes into your flesh. But even then, he comes into your flesh as a child, a, a, a baby. And he has to grow, go, go through all the growing stages just like a baby grows up into a, a child which grows up into a teenager and grows up into an adult. That's what we have to do as Christians to come to the fullness of the stature. So we progress and then when we come to the fullness of the stature, well, hopefully then we can suffer for righteousness sake. <laughs> suffer for righteousness sake because of the word. Yeah. Simply because we embrace the Word of God above all else, and then we are persecuted. The Bible says, then happy are you. (laughs) The disciples and then the apostles in the book of Acts, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame and reproach because of the name of Jesus. Because of holiness, because of purity, because of a good conversation. Because of embracing the truth of, the, of God and the scriptures. And many other things, however you want, might want to say that. And that's what we're coming to more and more. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to be the most hated generation. We have the most Christian abuse of authority and grace. We have the most amount of Christian scandal. We have the most amount of Christian misuse of the scriptures. We have the most, uh, you know... From the TV preachers and the, and the prosperity preachers, which have brought shame and reproach upon the name of Jesus. And God, by and large, did a lot of work to protect His name. But now, the sin and the iniquity of both the church and the world has become so bad that it cries for the Word of God to be fulfilled in the execution and manifestation of righteous judgment 
which he will magnify above his name. When the righteous judgment comes, it's going to bring more, even more reproach. Because righteous judgment is going to expose the folly and the scandal and the shame and the reproach of the, of the disgusting things that we've been doing as Christians and as ministers, as leaders, as saints. Right? It's going to expose it and the world's going to see it. It's going to make them even despise it the more. But God has to magnify His word above His name. Right? There's, the, oh, there's always an issue with sin and everything. And, and wherever possible, it's nice to uh, deal with sin in a controlled uh, way to avoid as much exposure as possible. And I'm sure that's preferred. And it's always better and great, better uh, usually when it goes that way. Right? Mercy rejoices against the judgment and all that stuff. So that, that's still a, a, a valid principle. But that's, by and large, in general, not the condition of the church that we live in today. Anyway, so it's a call to endure affliction, come to a stature where we can uh, suffer for righteousness' sake. Yeah, you can suffer for righteousness' sake. We talked also about uh, maligning these, uh, misaligning these principles, and in desperation, people trying to claim that uh, if, if we're we're trying to claim that what we're suffering uh, for our sins is suffering for righteousness' sake. Those are no; those are two different things. Many people suffering for their sin and their iniquity are, are trying to put the badge on like, hey, I'm suffering for righteousness sake. And you're not. You're suffering because of your sin and your iniquity. And to get past that point, you have to acknowledge that. Yeah. Right. Amen. True. So that you can follow on to suffer for yeah. His name's sake. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have the old man and the new man. Cause so so some kind of, some, sometimes it's kind of like a blend, right? right? Sometimes it's partly because of your Christian testimony, or partly because of what you're preaching, and then there's another side of it. it, it it's it's another side of it is just because of your sin, your transgression, and your iniquity, right? So right. there's, but we have to rightly divide all that stuff. Well, uh, so suffering for righteousness' sake, and to do that, you need to have root. We need to have root in ourselves, so that we stay in our resting place so that we hold our peace so that all the lies slanders and provocations that come at us from without do not knock us out of our resting place or compel us to retaliatory action that is not scriptural yeah. or that is not fitting for people who are in the stead of Christ that we are like lambs to the slaughter right we're like lambs to the slaughter who, when he was reviled, did not revile again. He committed himself to him, God, who is able to deal with this thing in total righteousness. And I was always saying, I, I'm riding, I'm riding the tightrope because you know, have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, reprove them. So you have to reprove unfruitful works of darkness. And doing so, you do so with a measure of impact and authority. And you can, you can slip into your own sore and, and try to be retaliatory while, while you're reproving those things. Nevertheless, they have to be reproved. Mm -hmm. They have to be exposed. The effect of the error of the church from the ministry on down upon the saints that aff affecting the way that they are able or not able to come to perfection has to be clarified and sorted out and exposed and identified properly with precept upon precept. So it's a tightrope walk. But I'm speaking in general terms. It's not for us to retaliate in a personal kind of way. In a personal kind of way. Because it is provocation. It is uh, persecution. It's things that are coming on us for righteousness sake. And sometimes for our sin, but sometimes for righteousness sake. Right? We, we, we need the right perception on all this stuff. All right. Thou therefore, my son, I'm in 2 Timothy chapter 2. There, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now, every time I see this scripture, I have a personal experience with this scripture where in earlier days of preaching and teaching, people would, some people would accuse me of uh, 
with just uh, just copycatting all the other preachers because I would listen to the things that I heard and learned and then I would parrot them out again. I would I would teach them again, right? And, it, and it's like there's scriptures in Ezekiel or somewhere in the prophets about every man steals his neighbor's words. Yeah. And I suppose there is a work where one person could take another man's counsel and put it forth like it's his own because he's after glory or whatever, vainglory. That, I guess that's possible. But it's like everything else. For every true, there's a counterfeit. For every counterfeit, there is a true. And the pattern is very similar. So what does God do with teachers? Well, teachers have teachers uh, get get what take what everybody else is saying and 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 they 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 compile it and break it down and they they put it in its proper order and see what's inaccurate or in, not accurate or that is accurate or what needs clarification or how it could be made clear and teachers take a lot of what they hear from around them and then mash it all up and send it back out again yeah. <laughs> in a compiled form right. So that's what this scripture is. So I was fretting. Oh, am I just stealing my brother's words? And, and am I only after vain glory? And there's a time that you're, you are that after vain glory. But one day I read this scripture and it was very quickened to me. And it settled my own spirit on the matter. Yeah, Paul said, commit these things to other men who shall teach him also. So they're going to say the same things that they were taught. They're not stealing words. They're fulfilling their calling. I'm fulfilling my calling. When I hear what other men say, and I note that it's the truth, or I note that that's, there's an error in it, and I, I clarify it, or whatever I do with what I hear other people say, and then say it again, it's things that have been committed to me that I also give, you know. So there, there, there's a way that that can be fulfilled that's not, it's not vainglory. It's not stealing your brother's words. So, here's the real scripture I'm after, though. Therefore, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure hardness. The hardness is endure affliction, endure persecution, endure trouble. Right? Remember, remember what Christianity is all about? If any man will come after me, let him first deny himself, then take up his cross. Oh, what? Daily, every day, every day get up thinking, well, I might have to suffer for righteousness sake. I might have to suffer for my, for my sin. We don't know the ways that God balances all the scales for sin and iniquity and everything else. And Well, anyway, that's another issue. But anyway, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. And that's my whole pitch now about sanctification. The things of this life. The things of this life. These bring forth no fruit to perfection. They hear the word. They do embrace the word. What happens? They are choked out with affairs of this life. That would be worldly ambitions. That would be for me over an overbalance of service to my carnal work, working at hotels at the expense of my calling or service to the brotherhood. That's what it would be. It would be out of balance. It can, it can choke me out. I'm just putting myself as the example. That, and then, so you don't get entangled with it. You don't get entangled with it. I was thinking of a scripture uh, in Isaiah, and I don't know the full context, but God the things that we think that we're getting satisfaction or pleasure or the, the worldly visions and ambitions that we're pursuing, career ambitions, uh, job ambitions, educational ambitions, or anything that's not the will of God, really, that can tangle you up or just simply occupy you and distract you from the real issues at hand. Any of those things, if God, if God helps us, then what God does is He makes those activities the source of vexation and trouble and anguish and tribulation until your heart turns against it. And the Bible says in uh, Isaiah about, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but about you know Israel's idols and stuff. It says, it says you'll get to the place where you take your idols and you'll cast them away like a menstruous cloth. 
All these things, none of these things is contributing to the cultivating and bringing forth of the life of Christ. What the hell am I entangling it for? Get thee hence, you like a menstruous cloth, you unprofitable activity. Get thee hence. Uh-huh. If God has to bring you to your wits' end with that stuff, turn gradually turn your heart against. You know, Lot vexed his righteous soul. He got too lingering in the affairs and entanglements in the uh, affairs of this life. Well, God was merciful to him, right? Dragged him out of the city, sent two angels. And that's the way we are. We're lot. We're like, we're like the, the church that is asleep when they all slumbered and slept. You know, they all slumbered and slept. As that uh, parable says, begins with describing the condition of God's people. We all slumbered and slept. So the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. No man that warth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. We all know that we have to have some kind of occupy, occupation and uh, exercise to a degree with the world. I pray not that thou take them out of the world, but that thou keepest them from the evil. Uh, they that are in the world as using the world, but not abusing the world or over entangling themselves. Beware lest at any time you be overcharged with overcharged, but there are things of this life that you are charged to do, right? Right? If you live in a farm, then you are charged to milk the cows, you are charged to string trim the uh, shed, shed area, or what? There are things that you are charged to do in this life, not overcharged. So it's, it's all striking that balance. But anyway, back to what we're talking about, enduring sufferings and having a rest a root in God, a resting place. The Bible says, lay not weight, O wicked man, against the righteous, spoil not his resting place. If a man is at rest, he's in the faith, he's at rest, he's trusting God to unfold things, and don't counsel him or provoke him in such a way that stirs up fear or takes him out of his rest and, and compels him to enter into his own works to, to try to vindicate himself or get back in your good graces or whatever. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a time to challenge people or talk to people or you know, discuss issues and, and things, but I'm just saying there is, a, there is a thing in the heart of God's people where we, we try to get into a resting place, a resting place, and it all hinges around trusting God and not taking um, God's... Uh, not rising up into God's seat. And it has a lot to do with being provoked and suffering for righteousness' sake and not retali- retaliating, not reviling, waiting on God, letting Him take the vengeance. Right? So that's, that's what I'm talking about tonight. So, you don't entangle with the affairs of this life so that you can please Him who hath chosen you to be a soldier. You're a soldier. And what does a soldier do? He fights a battle. And when you fight a battle, you know, our battle as Christians is more a defensive one. It can, it can take the offense. It can take the offense. But uh, as we've heard preached many times to us before, Christianity is much more reaction than action. So stuff comes your way. What is your reaction? Your response and if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Now this is Paul talking to Timothy. And he's explained to Timothy that if you're going to get the mastery, Timothy, you have to strive lawfully. And striving lawfully for the mastery means that if you're going to preach, if you're going to preach that you people you got to respond to afflictions and sufferings and persecutions, then you have to be partaker of it first, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's what he's saying, basically. And if you if if it's not like that, then you are striving unlawfully. The husbandman that labors is the first partaker of the fruit. I'm talking to you about the struggles of leaving your resting place when you're afflicted and reviled and slandered and everything and due diligence to hold your resting place because I am struggling with 
holding my resting place. That's why I'm preaching it. You want to all understand that, right? So it's a personal thing to me, and I understand it applies to others. Consider what I say, and Lord, give the understanding in all things. All things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So whatever you suffer, you're suffering not just for yourself, but for the elect. We're all suffering for each other, so we can minister to each other. Paul said, I can give you this consolation, the same consolation with, with, wherewith I was consoled of God, I can give you the same consolation. And that can work in reverse. You know, we can comfort one another with these words and, and so on. And we can edify one another in love. So it's a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign. reign. Now consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. It says Hebrews 3, I believe it is, 2 or 3. You know how I say that all the time. The apostle and the high priest. Well, it could have said, now consider the, uh, I don't know, con consider the king of glory and the son of God, Christ Jesus. No, it, it says, consider the apostle and the high priest. And I said that was significant, and it was in an order for a reason. Because where did he suffer? He suffered in the flesh, and when he was here 2,000 years ago, or whatever, in the flesh, that's when he was an apostle. That's where he suffered. That's where he learned obedience by the things he suffered. That's where he endured affliction, persecution. And then, what was after that? He was highly exalted. Resurrected and exalted to be a high priest. So the apostleship represents the humility, the suffering, the affliction. The high priest represents the promise of glory, resurrection, exaltation, partaker of his glory, and everlasting life. So you better consider them both. Consider them both. His apostleship is this life. The ex exaltation is what happened afterwards, right? For the joy that was set before him, the promise of exaltation, the promise of eternal life. And that promise, it has to have a substance in your heart or you won't have the strength to endure. You cannot have the strength to endure without the vision of that hope of glory, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have to cultivate that all the time. Think about it all the time. If we have hope only in this life, if we only consider the apostleship and the suffering and the agony and the torment and the persecution and nothing else, it's not hardly worth it to you, is it? But it most, miserable. most men, most miserable. Because there just doesn't seem to be any point. And yet you go on and on and on. Well, is there ever any judgment? Is there any any justice? Is there any... Yeah, down, oh, down the road there is. Yeah. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Remember, judgment isn't always penalty. Judgment is just simply that which brings to light and exposes the way something really is when everyone stands in darkness, unsure of the way something really is. Right? Now, a man says, oh, well, you robbed my store. And I said, well, no, I didn't rob your store. Well, there's confusion. There's darkness. Which, what, what way, which is it really? What, what's the real picture? What's the truth? The truth is hidden. It's in darkness because you have conflicting reports. Judgment would bring evidence. Oh, we have a video camera. Look. We see him coming into the store and walking out without paying for it. Right? So judgment would bring evidence, testimonies. Put light on the situation to expose it the way it is. So it could find the guy guilty of robbing the store. But on the other hand, the same kind of uh, exercise of judgment could vindicate somebody and say, oh, look, see, it's not him. Because the video camera shows that the guy who robbed the store uh, has no beard and this man that you're accusing has a beard or whatever, you see? And the judgment vindicates you. And that's what the Bible means when it says in Jesus, with Jesus in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. The judgment which should have enlightened everybody and vindicated him that no, uh, he had... 
righteous intent. He had, he had, a, you know, he was a righteous man. The, the things that the people were saying about him were not true. You understand that judgment? That judgment was taken away. So you have all kinds of upsetting of the scales of judgment. You have men full of sin and iniquity, the excess of naughtiness, walking after their own way, their own lust, their favorite pet sin, won't let go, loving the darkness. And they'll do that and claim, I'm being persecuted for righteousness sake. And all those other guys, they're the evil ones. And so the other guys are being slandered. They're being lied on. They're being persecuted. Because they won't stand for, that, for evil. They won't stand for the misuse of the Spirit, the misuse of grace, the misuse of anointing, calling, authority, and all that. So they are being persecuted, slandered for righteousness sake. So then it's important how you respond to that. So if we suffer with Him, we shall reign with Him, the Apostle and the High Priest. Before honor is humility. humility. We said that this is the necessity of perfection. Uh, if you start off with uh, glory, then you have to end up in humiliation. Yeah. Lucifer started off created in eternity with all perfection and glory. That was perfect. <laughs> in eternity, right? Started off in the glory. What happened? Well, he committed iniquity and he is forever headed for eternal humiliation. So now for us, it's necessary for us to start in humiliation and be brought into the glory. Okay, and when, that's a, a, again another message. So that's what we embrace and that's how we set our expectation according to the will of God so that we're not uh, offended and, and completely disillusioned if we see a prolonged period of time where it seems like Judgment is not coming to vindicate me, or what have you. And I like to tell the story of Pol Pot, because Pol Pot was a world ruler of Cambodia, was it Cambodia, and they know that he was responsible for killing millions of people, ruthlessly killing them. Uh, and uh, so what happened to Pol Pot? Oh, did they bring him to trial and prove that he was a murderer and hang him on a hang him or put him in the electric chair, or put him in jail for life. No, nothing happened. You know what happened to Pol Pot? Nothing. Nothing happened to Pol Pot. Pol Pot just went around his wicked ways for the rest of his life and he died peacefully in his sleep at no. an old age. No. <laughs> right. See? Now his judgment. His sins did not were not open going beforehand onto judgment. Now he has to face a great white throne judgment. And what really struck me, what was noteworthy about it, is that you know, people don't like Christians and preachers talking about the reality of hell and judgment and eternal damnation and all of that stuff. Yet, when Pol Pot died, with seemingly no... Uh, receiving no uh, payment for his evil... No this right. Uh, a political cartoonist who's not even a Christian writes a cartoon. It shows Pol Pot showing up at the gates of hell and uh, being greeted by Satan, which, you know, they depict it as a caricature, some guy with a pitchfork and whatever, in a red suit. Too. And, of course, it was a blasphemous thing. And Satan says, Mr. Pol Pot, what a pleasure to meet you, sir. Like Satan was bowing down to Pol Pot. And the the, uh, the implication was he's trying to emphasize how evil a man Pol Pot was. And yet, what's revealed in that is that you see how God has a way of showing the realities of his purpose to every man's conscience. And he has ways of doing it. Now, what's happening here is you have a man, a political editorial cartoonist or whatever, and... Uh, he sees that there's been no justice served upon Pol Pot. So what's the first thing that comes into his conscience? There must be a hell. Yeah. Because it's not right for a man to do all that and never be penalized or never receive his just due. So what's the implication of that? The implication of that to the consciences of men is that there must be a hell then. And in fact, 
for some people, they are hoping now there's a hell so that guy can be punished. That guy ought to be punished, and he wasn't. Well, I hope there's a hell. See? And it's actually testifying that there is another judgment. Because nature, you know, physical laws and the structure of the material world, all scientists and all those guys will tell you that everything comes to, everything eventually has to come to its balance and its equilibrium. You upset the scale here and it goes up there and everything comes back to its equilibrium, right? I mean, if you tilt your bathtub and you pour the water in, the water will be tilted until it finds its level. It, it's somewhere the water will level off. So if uh, the life of Pol Pot and his evil never, never reached its equilibrium here on earth, there's got to be something after this earth or after this life that balances the scales. Mm -hmm. That ought to testify to every conscience of man that there is another judgment after this. All right. Because things have to balance out one way or another. Now, so God has a way of stinging men's conscience with the truth like that. And so therefore, well, my real point is this then. My real point is uh, you see someone go on and on and on and on and seemingly nothing happens to them and you wonder and you wonder and you wonder. Don't mistake that for the favor of God. It, that's not necessarily the favor of God. Now, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. But I'm saying it's not necessarily the favor of God. When you see people presumptuously claim they're suffering for righteousness' sake and they're full of transgression and sin and iniquity and nothing happens to them, you know, that same presumption can make them think that, that God's on their side. Yeah. The same presumption. Same presumption. You have, you have another thing where you have another issue in the Bible where it talks about men who are committing wickedness and God just lets them go, lets them go, lets them go. The scariest thing for us or the fearful thing for us as Christians is if we go on and on and on and on and seemingly, wow, God's not dealing with anything in my life. Hmm. Well, that better be a big flag go off in your conscience because this is what our life is for, right? It's for God to be dealing with things and cleansing and purging and going on to perfection and not denying, not denying that those things are going on. So, uh, if we suffer with Him, we will reign with Him. If we consider His apostleship and His high priesthood. Just remember, you're going to reign with Him if you suffer with Him. And as we've always said, hey, there's three, three thieves on a cross, and the cross represents the flesh that you live in. You know, the flesh that you live in is your cross. Everybody's on a cross. Everybody is on a cross. Everybody on the face of the earth is in a flesh body that's going to make them suffer something somewhere. <laughs> and every one of them is going to suffer death. Every single Man is appointed to die, except, except those who be alive and remaining at the coming of the Lord. But you see what I'm saying? So if we're all going to be on a cross, and if suffering in one way, shape, or form is inevitable, let's um, apply ourselves to the gospel and apply ourselves in a way that our sufferings can work for good. <laughs> right? Embrace. That's why you want to embrace the sufferings of Christ. Of course, that's not a natural thing, right? When we're first saved, uh, you know, someone comes up and says, hey, I want you, just wondering uh, if you'd like to um, sign up for this uh, salvation program and suffer and have everybody say bad things about you and beat you up and da 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 da, da. You know, we, we, it's not the natural uh, response of the, uh, uh, of, it's, it's not our natural response to say, oh, yippee, yippee, I can't wait, where do I sign? <laughs> it's something that you have to start considering and and cultivate and and the only way of course we're going to do it is if we have that vision of the joy that is set before us a hope of glory being glorified with him There's nothing else is going to do it 
All right, now, Hebrews 10, 32, 33, Call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. There's another pattern here. Uh, there's a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and all that. You have all that imagery in the book of Revelation. And there was a, a dragon, and, she, and there's a woman to be pain to be delivered of a man-child. And the dragon sought to devour the child as soon as he was born. Yeah. As soon as that thing is born. Any manifestation of Christ in the flesh. Kill it, malign it, kill it. <laughs> you know, set it at naught. Minimize its effect. You know, whatever. It's just like when Jesus was born in the days of King Herod. Right? As soon as he was born, kill him. As soon as Christ comes forth, the days, as soon as you were illuminated, when you're first illuminated, or when you're illuminated and you finally act on that illumination, right? Let's say, for instance, you become illuminated that the religious world, the denominational Christian, so-called quasi-Christian world is Babylon, mother of harlots. It's the counterfeit. And you realize it's come out of her, my people, that you... Receive not of her plagues, and that you be not partaker of her sins. Right? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. See, sanctification again. Come out from among them, and I will receive you. And you will be my sons, and you will be my daughters. And every time, and let's say you, you knew that, but you didn't act on it. You haven't acted on it. And then finally you get built up in the Word, and enough faith that finally you act, and you come out of her. Well, what's going to happen? They're going to come after you. <laughs> Consider after you were illuminated and you acted upon that, you endure a great fight of affliction. Everybody in the church that you came out go, what are you doing? You're not going all out, you're not leaving us and going into one of those cults, are you? Right? And you're gonna be persecuted and they're gonna to try to drag you back in. And you're gonna suffer. Consider the former days. Call to remembrance the former days. After you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. Okay, and I, I made reference to this in Acts. They departed from the presence of the council. This is after the council of Gamaliel. They were speaking in the name of the Lord, and they charged them, don't you speak in this name of the Lord, and they took him into prison, and... Gamaliel sought forth to put them forth a little space. You know, if this be of God, then you can't fight it. And so they beat them and let them go. And then uh, this is the apostles, Peter and I guess James or John. or Anyway, they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Rejoicing. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, Peter said... Happy. Happy are ye. My brethren, count it all joy when men speak evil of you. They say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. For so did they with the prophets that went before you. Behold, I send unto you prophets, scribes, and wise men. Not just prophets. I sent you prophets, scribes, and wise men. And you will persecute them out of your places. You'll put them out. Drive them out of your synagogues. Count it all joy. Now we told you before that, we're going to say it again, that the wicked, when a man is in wickedness, now I'm going to cut some slack here. You know, you could be a righteous man, but you haven't been cleansed of something yet, and you're operating at some times in your wickedness. I said this before. In this flesh, we're going to see the manifestation of old man and new man because they're both struggling to be manifested in our flesh, and we succumb to one, the old man, and then we successfully yield to the new man, and we're, we're back and forth like that. Now, it ought not to be, but it's one of the inevitabilities of going on to perfection, right? Okay, so when I'm... So I'm, I'm qualifying what I'm saying about wickedness. If you're a wicked man, that wicked man is operating in you, and he looks at Christ, he is going to accuse you of what he is guilty of. 
Yeah. Right. He's going to say, we're the ones that speak all manner of evil. Well, this is an issue of, it's like I said before, we can have grace, but not to the profaning of God's holiness. Not to the misuse of anointing authority, calling, misusing. Well, we went through that whole thing. Yeah, count it all joy when men say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Great is your reward in heaven. So we can count that joy as much as we are partakers of that and to a great degree we have been. All right. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and of children and heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this pleasant time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Well, that sounds like somebody who's weighing the apostleship, the sufferings, with the high priesthood, the glory that shall be revealed, and weighing it all together and saying, well, boy, these sufferings are, are pretty tough, but the glory that shall be revealed whoop, just puts the scales on the other end. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's really something we got to embrace. And Paul talking about himself as the apostles, <clears throat> being an example of suffering for righteousness' sake, he says, For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were, appointed to death. For we, we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise. We are weak, but we are weak, but you are strong. We are, ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger, thirst, are naked, buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place, and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled. We call them names? No. no. Being reviled, we bless. Bless your ministers, God. In spite of all this junk going on, may they finish their course anyway. You know, if they're, if they're saying something in there that's the truth, I hope you prosper it. And if they're saying lies about God's people, I hope you shut their mouth. Amen. And if they speak truth, I'd still like to hear it. Amen. Right? right. Being reviled, bless. Bless them, Lord. <laughs> yeah, let, if, if there's something that you got to do there, may it continue. Right? right. So let, not, let it not be an issue of personal grievance against the guy. And then by and large with ministers, as they become more and more mature, if they expose the wrongdoing to others, and especially other ministers, it's not always because they're, uh, 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 because they got some kind of grudge against the guy. Come on, is there, is there more Christ to me than that? <laughs> if I dare say, after 40 years of being a teacher? Anyway. And I will plead. You'll watch it. I'll make this entreaty to those who speak against us falsely. I'll make this entreaty. All right. Being defamed. Okay. Being persecuted. We take vengeance. Oh, being persecuted and slandered. Oh, we go take him to court and sue him for libel. No. Being persecuted, we suffer it. And it's hard suffering it. Especially when it goes on and on and on and on. Seem like no judgment come to pass. No vindication for the righteousness of Christ that's in many. Seems like. Seems like. Well, remember Pol Pot. Is, is, is our, and here's something to consider. And I say this, Lord, does this mean maybe my vindication is not going to come until we're all in front of the judgment seat of Christ? Do I have to go the rest of my life suffering the slander and the... Uh, malignment and everything it's possible did you ever think about it maybe you might go the whole rest of your life not vindicated yeah. and you'll die not, some did not accept deliverance because it wasn't God's deliverance some didn't ex 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 accept if you might want to take it further vindication because it was vindication that was not orchestrated by God 
You know, it was their own or somebody else's. It's like, you know, if I were being tried falsely or something for some crime I, that, I, that I didn't commit, I wouldn't want a lawyer to vindicate me. Why should a lawyer vindicate me? Woe to you lawyers! That's the general consensus of the scripture about lawyers. Woe to you lawyers! Right? And when did any man of God ever look to the arm of flesh for vindication? Never. Now, um, being persecuted, we suffer. Being defamed, we entreat. So don't, don't let the expression of the authority of a teacher be misconstrued as some sort of uh, issue of malice. It is a, it's, it's an increasing desperation of entreating and pleading something that others refuse to consider. They refuse. So it comes out in more of desperation, in more authority, in, in more attempts to express a plea. We are made as the filth of the world and the offscoring of all things unto this day. Of course, you know, are we going to use the laws or the court systems of this world? God forbid. You know, God forbid. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints, especially if we're talking about issues between ourselves as brothers, whether you took my ladder and I didn't, let, didn't give you permission or whether you know, you're slandering me or whether you... Whatever it is. If it's between brethren, if it's an issue within the church... Why, in God's name, would anybody go to a lesser, carnal, secular court of law to try to settle some sort of Amen. spiritual matter? Yeah. There's no sensibility in that whatsoever. It can only be motivated by, by issues of personal vindication and vengeance. Or revenge. And we know what the Bible says, what God says. God says, uh, you know, vengeance is mine, I will repay. So I'm not going to go sue the guy that's lying about me. You know, trying to call me a false teacher or whatever. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sue him in a court of law. You know, have at or do go do what you're gonna do. I'll, I'll make a plea for the righteousness of Christ and for the things that are necessary for restoration, and I'll continue to do so. And I'll ride that tight rope. And if I get if I get off on it, and I overstep my bounds, I will suffer chastisement and scourging for it. And I know that. All right, so. That's why don't be many masters. Don't everybody try to rise up and be a master and deal with things. Because we receive... Greater. Yeah, and more is required of us. It's, it's a real tight rope, rock, walk. I'm telling you, it is. So you have a matter against the unjust and you don't go to the saints. Don't you know that the saints shall judge the world? And you, most of us know this. If the world's, world's going to be judged by you, are you not unworthy to judge the smallest matters? No, you not. You shall judge angels. So if you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the earth, in the church. And I believe the context of that is, you know, more like carnal issues that they had in the church. But the principle remains the same. An issue that's within the church. Why would you go to the carnal? Why would you go to the worldly courts to try to settle a spiritual issue? And then Paul goes on to say, uh, Why do you not take the wrong? Why do you not rather just suffer yourselves to be defrauded? And if it's the Pharisee, it's often I've said, if, if I'm just a Pharisee pitching my own standard or trying to bring everybody under the law, right? If that's what I am and then you have issue with that, then Jesus, then do what Jesus said and said, uh, leave them alone. They're just the Pharisees. They're the blind leaving, leading the blind. Just leave them alone. Just leave them alone. If I'm just a Pharisee. But if you can't get it out of your craw and you got to keep coming at me and coming at me and whatever, then that's an evident token that there's more to this than Pharisee and law and legalism. There's a nag in your conscience from the Holy Ghost. You can't let it go. You can't let the issues go. So I speak to your shame. Is there not a wise man among you not able to judge between your brother but brother goes to law with brother and before the unbelievers and you know, I've heard people try to justify taking their own vengeance and stuff uh, and pursue issues like that by saying, yeah, well, he's not my brother. Yeah. But look, the Christian, the Christian principle in general is if, if, if the heathen, if I do a job and the heathen doesn't pay me, 
Do I go to small claims court and sue him? No, I don't. I just say, he's a heathen. He's not even subject to the law of God. Well, God, he did me this injustice. So I, I'm not, I don't want to rise up in my, my own works and try to exact everything I think that belongs to me in this life and pursue it and make sure I get my due from everybody, every step along the way, so I'm going to go sue them in small claims court. What a bunch of nonsense. Yeah, I've had this happen. So they don't pay me, they don't pay me. Move on. Yeah. I can't add a cubit to my stature. If I'm supposed to get the $1,100 and they didn't give me the $1,100, well, someone will write it. You know, I'll get a $1,100 job that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Yeah. God will balance the scales. God will balance the scales. He'll make it right. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. All right, let's look at the scripture in 1 Peter. This is thankworthy. If a man for conscience towards God endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Don't tell me there isn't a struggle. There isn't a pain. There aren't tears. There isn't an anguish. A rustling in the mind and the spirit that, wow, they said I did such and such a thing. Wow, someone said I did so and so and so and so with another man's wife and I never did it. Or, or somebody said, oh, I went and robbed the bank and I never did it. Don't tell me you wouldn't go home and, and say, oh, now they all think I'm this and they all think I'm that and I'm not. Oh, you know. There's going to be something in you that wants to rise up and try to say, hey, 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 I can prove I didn't do that. What? You know, or whatever, right? So every time you have this happen, this affliction, this persecution, slanders and speaking evil of you falsely because of, of, of the word's sake, you're going to have a, some grief. You're going to have some pain. You're going to have a, it's a provocation. It's going to try to stir you out of your resting place. So, but it's thankworthy. Thank you, Lord, that I have a testimony and that I, have a, I am a partaker of Christ's sufferings, that they would say these evil things against me falsely for your name's sake. What glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. You have need of, we have need, you have need of, we have need of patience. 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 The ability to endure and hold your peace and stay in your rest and let God deal with it. Not to usurp the place of God in dealing with it. Now, it's hard. I know we all want to deal with things, right? I would love it if the, uh, if the uh, slanders were proved, proven wrong and uh, the people that think I'm a, a heathen and an enemy and a Pharisee would say, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We shouldn't have thought that about you, brother. We'll have fellowship again. I'd love that. But there's something that I can't take vengeance, right? I can't. It's all how I respond to it. For even hereunto were you called. Here's what you were called to. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow His steps. Which steps are they? Well, first, who did no sin, as much as you've attained and overcome certain areas of sin, then don't sin, you know. Work out the rest of your salvation with fear and trembling, but neither was guile found in his mouth. Right? So we don't want to be found with guile. And the issue of guile is always critical, as we said before. Blessed is the man to the Lord, whom the Lord will not impute iniquity, in whose spirit is no guile, no pre planned agenda, you know, no. Uh, beforehand, making excessive provisions for, scheming, planning, deliberating, guile, deceit. The, that's the iniquity that is not imputed. So, neither was guile found in his mouth. Yeah. So, in other words, he just didn't throw out a bunch of revilings and slanders and name callings and accusations that could not be proven or had no scriptural basis. 
He didn't, he didn't do that. There's no guile in his mouth. He didn't retaliate. He, he knew what he was doing. He, 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 had, he had peace about it within himself before God, and he just held his peace. Right? Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he did not threaten. You watch what happens to those folks around down there because of what they did to me. No, he didn't do that. Is that what he said on the cross? He got up on the cross. And, did he point the finger down at everybody down there? Jesus on his cross and say, you know, what, what I just said. You're going to be sorry for the way you treated me down there, you guys. You're going to get it. No, he didn't do that. When he suffered, he threatened not. What did he do? He committed himself to him that judges righteously. And who is that? God. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body in the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. For you were as sheep going astray, but now you're returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So don't think of yourself as sheep gone astray. We're supposed to embrace the fact that we have now been restored, brought back to the shepherd and bishop of our souls. In capital letters, that's Jesus. Okay. Romans 12, 18 and 19. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with oh. all men, even the ones that are reviling you. Yep. I mean, uh, be at peace with them. I mean, you may be separated from them and you don't have fellowship with them anymore and all of that. There's nothing you can do about that, in the, at least in the short term, before, unless God decides to do something about it. But live, be at peace about the situation and live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written... Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Mm-hmm. You know, Jeremiah had the issue in Jeremiah 12, and I quote it all the time. Lord, uh, thou, Lord, thou art righteous when I plead with thee, but uh, I have a question. How come the way of the wicked prosper? How come they just go on and on and on and on, and no retribution seemingly? They always seem to slip through the cracks. Yeah. They just never seem to get the, you know... The degree of what happens to them never matches the severity. The penalty never matches the severity of what they've done. And everybody who's been slandered never seems to get vindicated here. We all look like a bunch of fools, tools, and whatever. <laughs> right? That's what Jeremiah says. Where, why do the way of the wicked prosper? And so we've got to understand the ways of God are, are like that. We may not see vindication. You may not see vindication in this life. Maybe you will, and maybe you won't. Are we prepared not to? Are we have enough root in ourselves that we can just move on from it and if we never get vindicated in this life? Do we have enough root in ourselves to know what's going on? Hold our peace. Stay in our resting place. Don't get too overly bent out of shape that we would revile or rise up to take vengeance or go sue somebody or whatever. Right? So, uh, and uh, Solomon in Ecclesiastes says a, a lot of the same things. He said, you know, he's implying that in general, I saw things that just seem out of whack. Like they seem opposite of the way they should be. I saw princes just sitting there walking on the earth and the servants riding upon the horses. That doesn't seem right. Shouldn't the princes be riding on the horses and the servants walking upon the earth? Yeah, I, I saw I saw many of the common people uh, maligned and tormented and struggling in their faith and everything else and struggling to fulfill the word of God. And I, I saw other men who just seemed to be able to go on in their wickedness and go unabated, go on their course seemingly with no no retribution, no consequence, or, or very little consequence. You might see it like that. You might see it like that for a long time. You know how Jesus said, the last are going to be first, and the first are going to be last. And then you have the story of Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man, while he fared sumptuously every day, he fulfilled his lust, his ambition. He did what he wanted, pleased himself, did all this thing. Nothing, And then nothing happened until afterwards... Now he's in hell, and Lazarus is in the, carried by the angels into Abraham's 
bosom. And we know what the counsel of, of Abraham is. He says to the rich man, Son, you in your lifetime, you received good things. You never suffered anything in this life. You received your good things. You fared sumptuously. You lived in delight, comfort. You didn't have affliction or trouble or anything. You, you, you in your lifetime received your good things. Lazarus was laid in the gate full of sores. Dogs had to come and lick his sore. He had to be comforted. Some of the Christians out here today have to be comforted by the heathen. Have to have experiences where the heathen show them some kindness or comfort. Well, Lazarus in his lifetime received the evil things. Now, after their life is over, now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And that's the way it is with a lot of things. The devil makes everything appear like it's this way and then God's going to flip it around after, after judgment. After judgment comes, whether it's in this life or the white throne judgment or the judgment seat of Christ or however you're going to consider judgment. The last of the first, the first of the last. Those that seem to get away with everything and finish their course while doing all kinds of evil, they are going to flip and be judged and condemned and tormented. And those who seemingly were represented as evil and who weren't are going to be vindicated and glorified and exalted. You know, Isaiah even says, your, your brethren that hated you, that cast you out, that said, you know, uh, let the Lord be glorified and magnified, and that cast you out for my namesake, he said, I'll, I'll appear to, to your glory, and I'll make them ashamed. God can flip it. God can flip it just like that, right? You know, for the, right, for the man who is poor and needy and seeking God, he can turn the desert into a blossoming, what, a blossoming, whatever, garden. A blooming garden. He, he turned the des, desert, desert land into a flowing stream. And he can, he can send the fruitful land, and, and for, he can take the fruitful land and turn it into a barren wilderness for the wickedness of them that dwell there. And he can just take it and just flip it around. So, what's the, uh, what, what, what do we say in conclusion? Well, we got to wait. <laughs> and see what God is going to do here. We just have to wait. So, give place to wrath. Give place to vengeance. Stay in your resting place. Uh, if you're doing something that God tells you to do in terms of reproving uh, dangerous counsels, misapplications of the scriptures, and things that would affect the rest of the body of Christ, that become things that can prevent the saints from going to perfection, as I say I do, then uh, you know we have to proceed in the fear of God as well with that. Be very careful. And that's not for everybody to do, and I, I don't believe it is for everybody to do, and, and I'm riding that tightrope. Now, Psalm 31. In thee, O Lord, uh, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Very important. Yes, we want to be delivered, but we have to be delivered in the righteousness of God. I'll again, draw attention to Hebrews 11. Some not accepting deliverance. Right? What was the example? He was, oh yeah, the lawyer. I would not let a lawyer try to vindicate me and bring me deliverance from a false charge. I'd rather let the Lord do it through circumstance and working. Right? All right. Uh... Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privily for me. For thou art my strength. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. I have hated them that regard lying vanities. But I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy. Thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul in adversities. Remember, when you suffer for righteousness' sake in any way or for the word's sake, you're going to endure grief in your conscience. You're going to struggle. There's going to be a conflict. There's going to be an anguish, an agony, uh, a cry even. And uh, just that is the time when Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost is going to draw very nigh to you. 
Remember, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Because that's where your intimacy is, your personal intimacy with the Lord. If you can endure through that and have patience through it, you will get visitations from the Lord. You will get direct personal visitation from the Lord. He will come to you. And those experiences will do a, uh, go a tremendous way in, in confirming and developing your root in self. And He'll keep you through it. And He won't leave you or forsake you in those situations. Okay, so, and he'll know your soul in adversities. And thou hast not shut me up into the hand of the enemy. Thou hast set my feet in a large room. Well, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful. One of my greatest fears in coming out of fellowships that were apostatized was that I was faced with, uh, with going back into the world. I had no Christian fellowship. You know, I was leaving an environment of Christian community and I was coming out into, uh, I didn't know where I was coming out to. <laughs> had no idea. Am I just going to end up in the world and the world is going to swallow me, swallow me up and that's the end of me and I'll never teach or preach again? And that's a very real fear that I had. But uh, God did not shut me up into the hand of the enemy. Oh, nope. He set my feet in a large room. He gave me liberty to continue the practice and exercise of my calling. And it's a large room. I like to say this. We're at liberty. God puts us in a large room, large enough that we can walk around sort of spiritually and feel after God. We can try this. Uh, we can try that. Uh, you know, I can, you understand, not, not a little room, but to venture out and try things in your life that you think are the will of God, you put your feet in a large room. Just remember, it's a large room, but it's not a football field. <laughs> it's still... It's still a boundary. It's just not you can do anything you want. You understand, right? You have... have mercy upon me, Lord. I am in trouble. My mind is consumed with grief. Yea, my soul and my belly, for my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity. My bones are consumed. I was a reproach among all mine enemies, but especially among my neighbors. That's what happens when they speak evil about you falsely. The brothers that used to be your friends and your neighbors... Now you are a reproach to them, especially if they believe the lying counsels, the slanders against your own integrity. So I was a reproach among my enemies, but especially among my neighbors, and a fear to my acquaintance. They that did see me, they that did see me without fled from me. I've actually had this happen. I've had I've met up with somebody in a store from a fellowship that I I had to come out of. And they were speaking evil of me and, and most of the people, many of the people in that fellowship thought I was a very evil man. Stay away from me. And I saw him in the store. He didn't recognize me at first. So I said, I said hello and he shook my hand and there's another, another Christian with him that he was staying with. And that Christian said, hey brother, you don't recognize Jonathan? You don't recognize, you, do, you don't remember Jonathan? And then when he finally realized I was the Jonathan that used to be at the ministry he was at, he went, oh no, and he threw up his hands and he actually fled and ran around the other aisle because I was so evil spoken of. <laughs> so I actually watched him flee. Yep, they'll flee from you. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I'm like a broken vessel. I've heard the slander of many. I'm going to talk about slander again one more time. I've heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. Yeah, portray me as a false teacher. Destroy my influence among the people of God. Okay, that's how it happens with me personally. They've taken away my life. But God won't take away my life. If I'm supposed to teach, I'll teach. Right? If they kill me, he'll re resurrect me and I'll go teach. If it's somewhere else, it would be somewhere else. Like here, this is somewhere else. It's one way, shape, or form. I trusted in thee. I said, thou art my God. My times are in thy hand. See that? My times are in thy hand. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to speak up. A time to not speak up. There's a time. 
For me, there's a time behind a pulpit to make a plea and speak up, and then there's another situation, there's a time for me not to speak, and then just leave it alone. And like just the rest of you, there's a time. All of my times, Lord, are in your hand. The time and the day and the hour and the minute and the second of my vindication, my time, it's in your hand. The time of my deliverance from sin is in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from them that persecute me. Make thy face shine upon thy servant. Save me for thy mercy's sake. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon thee. Didn't call on, I didn't call on the police. Didn't call on the doctors. I didn't call on the uh, marriage counselors. <laughs> didn't call on the lawyers. I called upon thee. So don't let me be ashamed, Lord. Don't let me be ashamed. I'm calling on you. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence. I've often said that. I hear lying lips. I'm very bold in my prayers. Of course, I'm by myself. There's nobody to offend at that time except God himself. But I said, God, if such and such a person, if he's speaking the truth, bless him and let him go. You know, give him free course. But if he lies, shut the lying m- mouth. Let the lying lips be silent. Let them be put to silence. Let them be ashamed of the lies they tell. Speaking grievous things proudly, contemptuously against the righteous. How great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. And that's what I, God, keep me, shield my soul from the ill effects of this striving of tongues. The strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for He hath showed me His marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. So, he'll strengthen our hearts in all this. He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth the slander is a fool. I'm going to read, what am I going to read here? Uh, Shall I read them? I'll read this first. And I brought this psalm out a couple weeks ago. Um, Psalm 37, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. They shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. I'm going to cut the slack again. You you could be the wicked man operating in you. May the wicked man in in anybody like that may, may, may be cut down like the grass. And if there's also a new righteous man in you, well, then he can come forth now because the wicked man in you has been cut down. See, you understand this, this, this uh, operation and this manifestation of the old man and the new man flipping back and forth in the same body. I can pre- preach a scripture like, you know, cut off the wicked man who speaks lies. And I'm not calling for your destruction. I'm not calling for your condemnation. I'm saying there is a wicked way in there that is that it's developed after the fashion of the old man that still has an exercise and a practice in your flesh. Let that thing be cut off. Yeah. Cut it off. Yeah, don't worry about that because that that evil motion of the evil man, he, he's soon going to be cut down like grass and wither like the herb. Trust in the Lord, do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. Ask the Lord. Lord, plead the causes of my soul. Right? To them uh, that wrongfully accuse me. Plead my causes right. Lord, you plead their cause right, right to their soul. You plead it. Plead it to them. 
and commit it to the Lord, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, thy judgment as the new day. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. This is precisely summarizes all that we're saying. It's all in the, in the scripture. One verse here. Rest. Hold your rest. Hold your peace. Wait patiently for him. And don't get, don't fret because of who? The man who prospers in his way and bringeth wicked devices to pass. Why do the way of the wicked prosper? And like I say, there's many reasons. One, God may be reserving them in chains of darkness and he's just got them reserved and they'll never see it until judgment day. Or it could be, yeah, God's still going to deal with it, but believe it or not, it's not according to our time frame. And uh, there's a certain time that God has ordained, and that's when He's going to do it, and we've got to wait a little while. You understand? Either way, rest in the Lord. The Lord knows all this stuff. So don't fret because He seems to prosper in His way while doing wickedness. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Yet a little while the wicked shall not be. Yea, though thou diligently consider his place, it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. It means he, he yells at him, maligns him, calls him names, utters slanders, and gives, speaks falsely against them in a disparaging, angry, raging kind of way, thinking he's standing upon his authority. You know, there's a scripture that says... Uh, you know, you work wickedness, it's an indictment against the church. You do you do this and you do that and you thieves and you commit adultery and you, do, and you stand upon your sword. In other words, you use, you use an offensive sword. You use an offensive rhetoric, your sword and an authority to stand in the condition that you are and to, and to remain in that condition of evil practices. And you're using your sword to do it. That's the wrong use of the sword. Yeah, the wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him. He seeth that his day is coming. See, no man can do that stuff without a retribution. Right? Because God is the avenger of all of that. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent the bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation, lifestyle. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. The arms of the wicked shall be broken. The Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Right? The Bible says, God will keep your soul alive in the time of famine. So we listen to preachers and men of God and stuff, and when I listen, and, and we, we kind of come to this consensus that many times we'll listen and there really isn't a whole lot of substance in the, in the preaching. It's like there's not a whole lot of uh, expounding or a whole lot of substance. It's kind of like a time of famine. Oh, you'll think, hear things here and there. But God will keep our soul alive. This is also the man who can rest, wait patiently, Stay in his place. Have root in yourself. The man who frets not in any wise to do evil. And this is the exhortation. And it, we, we need it because the evildoers are very pro provoking. What, is, what does what provocation do? Pro, what is provoking? Someone who provokes you is trying to get an evil response out of you. Or maybe he's not. Maybe the devil is and he's using him. But whatever. You see what I'm saying? Provoke. Yeah, yeah. I do. How many people know I do that on purpose? I provoke. See, they make the evil come out. And then I'm, we've said it all along. God does not tempt men with evil. God doesn't cast the stumbling block in front. God doesn't provoke you to do evil. No, we're the ones that provoke God. We're the ones who provoke one another. 
you know, provoke one another to love and good works. You know, don't provoke with rashness in your mouth and all of that kind of stuff. But that's what it says. They they you know, they gnash upon him with his teeth. Their sword shall enter into their own heart. Their bow shall be broken. The little of a righteous man, his path is better than the riches of many wicked. The arms of the wicked shall be broken. The Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. In the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. God, keep our souls alive in this time of famine. And I believe he is. I feel like he is anyway. So let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon thee. Let the wicked be ashamed, and let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence. I've read that already. Okay. Yep, let the lying lips be put to silence. Psalm 50. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken, and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. That's out of the church, Zion, the holy city. Our God shall come, and he shall not keep silence. The fire shall devour before him, and it shall be a very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God has judged himself, Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. Every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are all mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. <laughs> now, we're not going to do anything to help God out here. <laughs> he has it all, he knows it all, he owns it all, he is it all, he's God. Right? You can see the point being made here. Will I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Now our vow to God is like David said, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? You know, bless the Lord on my soul, forget not all his benefits, who heals all thy iniquity, who heals all that forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. That's the benefits of God. David says, What shall I give unto the Lord for all his benefits? Pray ten hours a day, give a million dollars. No, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows. You know, our vow is that, okay, God, you're going to do this. You're going to give us the benefit of forgiving all our sins, all our iniquities, heal our, all our diseases. What are we going to do? Well, we'll take this cup then. We'll take this cup of sufferings. And we'll call on the name of the Lord. And we will... Fret not ourselves in any wise to call on the world or the arm of flesh or the courts of the land or whatever. Call upon me. Okay. Offer God thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for this persecution. Right. Pay thy vows unto the Most High. I will call upon the name of the Lord and take it. Take this. I will accept it as something God has dealt out to me. And I will have faith that God will give me the strength and the endurance to get through it all. Okay, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked, God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee? When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sitteth and speaketh against thy brother, and thou slanderest thine own mother's son. We said it before, the mother is the church, the son is the Christian. You're going to speak evil and slander your Christian brother in any way like that? Okay, these things has done, thou hast done, and I kept Silence. You get it? All this stuff going on, and I kept silence. Nothing happened. Pol Pot killed millions of people. God kept silence. Men of renown and authority committing wickedness and slander and everything else and this and that and every evil thing. God says, I kept silence. I kept silence. 
I sit back and I watched and took the whole thing into account, took inventory of it all. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. This is a scary scripture. We're ministers. I consider myself as a minister standing in Christ's stead. If I'm standing like that in wickedness, God could say, oh, you thought you were in my stead. You thought I was altogether such a one as myself. You thought you were a similitude of me, huh? You thought you were a prototype of me, huh? You're doing all these evil things and I keep silence. Remember King Manasseh? King Manasseh sinned and screwed around and screwed up and shed innocent blood. Well, how did he shed innocent blood? He spoke evil things against the people of Israel. Evil things against them that weren't true. Shed innocent blood. That's what it means to shed innocent blood now. You don't want to get into this issue of blood guiltiness. David said, deliver me from blood guiltiness. I don't want to murder my brother with words of lying slanders. I don't want to do that. Then I'll have this blood on my hands. If I have a righteous indictment and a righteous plea uh, towards my brother, that's one thing. But I don't want to have blood guiltiness. I don't want to have blood guiltiness. King Manasseh, 55 years. God didn't do anything to him. Nothing. You understand? Nothing. He did all kinds of evil things. God did nothing. He kept silence. He kept silence. That doesn't mean we're, the, the people who were, he sinned against would never be vindicated. It didn't mean he was getting away with it. It just means that's how God does it sometimes. So we always say about King Manasseh, yeah, he, he finally got his truckload, his mother load of affliction right at the end of his life. And that did humble him. And he did find peace with his God and was buried with his fathers. Believe it or not, he did. No. These things that was done, I kept silence. Thou thoughtest I was altogether such as one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set thee in, in order before thine eyes. Consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoso, offer, whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright, I will show the salvation of God. This is the fearful reality, the fearful thing of slander in the mouth of ministers, men of God, even the Christian. You don't, you don't want to get into blood guiltiness. You don't want to start slandering the righteous in a way that justifies the evil that you're doing or anything else. And then meanwhile, we still want to pray, hope, have faith. We want to have patience. Make sure that we stay in our resting place. Stay in with our root in self. You see, if, if I have root in myself, if a whole bunch of teeth people tell me, I'm nothing but a freak, I'm not a teacher, I never will be, you're just a goon, you're a clown, you're this, you're that. Well, if I have my root and self, no, God told me uh, 50 times I'm a teacher sent from God. You weren't there in the room when He visited me. and uh, and uh, I don't care what they say then. I don't care. Say all you want. I, I know who I am. Amen. <laughs> right? Jesus says, the devil is coming. He's got nothing in me. He can't get a rise out of me. I know who I am. I'm the Son of God. <laughs> he can say I'm not. Right? He that utters a slander is a fool. Let him be a fool. Then. I, 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 don't, I know who I am. See, that, that's kind of the thing you have to get to. Then once you get there, you got to hold it. <laughs> I, I don't always feel that. Sometimes I feel that confidence of root and self. You know. Other times I, I struggle with it. You know, I have to go and fight and go talk to God and, and, and reestablish that and get that all settled again. And, okay, I'm back to my resting place. Okay. <laughs> now, do whatever you're going to do, God. Here's my desire. My desire is that they would really know my true intent and they would stop slandering me and everything else and whatever. But, you know, it's in your hands, right? Okay. That's it. I'm done. Praise the Lord.